In the second part of the film, I will discuss Soviet developments that stood out as the best in the world. With growing expertise, Soviet engineers had begun crafting their own models of highly successful wood gas cars. Without exaggeration, these vehicles were unmatched globally. We'll delve into the world's fastest wood gas car, boasting the superior qualities typical of gasifier cars. This wood gas car was the brainchild of a talented engineer, a man with a remarkable destiny. His sister was the renowned Soviet actress Tatyana Peltzer. Their home welcomed the bard Vysotsky, while Yuri Gagarin counted Peltzer among his friends. Like many of his contemporaries, Peltzer had a passion for automobiles from a young age. He started his career as a car mechanic and later obtained a driver's license, transitioning to become a driver himself. After graduating from the Electromechanical Institute, Peltzer contributed to the construction of a car factory in Nizhny Novgorod before moving to the capital's Nadi, Scientific Automobile Tractor Institute, later renamed NAMI. He took part in numerous car rallies, including the renowned Diesel Rally in 1934. It was in the same year that he began crafting the world's fastest wood gas passenger car. Mazin pursued a similar path. Peltzer, with a lineage that was half Jewish, half German, much like his sister, likely inherited intellect and diligence from both sides, shaping him into a bright and talented engineer thriving in Soviet Russia. Despite not being ethnically Russian, his passion for fast driving and residence in Russia defined his identity. Peltzer's initial venture into gasification involved fitting a truck with a gasifier installation. Together, Mazin and Peltzer worked at Nadi, the heart of the automobile industry in the burgeoning, now Crimson Empire. Starting with minimal industry, they began in bast shoes and carts. The first transport factories had to be acquired under foreign licenses for gold. The technology for manufacturing passenger cars, for instance, was procured from Ford, laying the foundation for the Soviet car M1. Even before the first M cars rolled off the assembly line in 1936, Peltzer and Mazin had already developed a gasifier for them in 1934, named Avtotor 3. Mazin's iteration was essentially a scaled-down version of the Avtotor 2 gasifier, tailored for passenger cars, as discussed in the first part. Автомобиль работает на древесном топливе. Запаса горючего хватает на 200 километров пути. Это первая пробная машина. Скоро начнется серийное производство легковых газогенераторных автомобилей. A similar gasifier but fundamentally different, was also created by Peltzer, there were two prototypes that won on the moscow Kiev moscow car rally in September 1935. Peltzer installed it at Nadi, with the help of his colleagues, Malakovsky, Fitterman, and Dushkevich. They assembled it in the second taxi fleet of the Union, where Peltzer later attempted to launch taxis on wood, as was done in Europe. Apparently, Peltzer wanted some cars to be produced with gasifiers as standard assemblies, as was done in Europe at Ford, Renault, Mercedes, and many others. Instead of a separate gasifier installation kit for the car. The install it yourself kit, as was done at that time for tractors and trucks, where the gasifier was supplied separately to car bases. Peltzer spent five years, from 1934 to 1938, designing and refining the gasifier. He started his work at Nadi, but later the director of Nadi and the head of the gasifier department, Ananyev, did not support Peltzer's ideas and even began to obstruct them. Apparently, the construction of gasifiers for passenger cars was no longer considered rational. At that time, gasoline was very cheap, and calculations showed that the savings on a cargo truck with wood blocks compared to the cost of liquid fuel amounted to only a fraction of the gasoline consumed, from an economic point of view. Moreover, even for trucks and tractors before the war, the problem of fuel fragmentation was not solved, there were not enough axe men, and the blocks were chopped and split by hand. The problem of dryers and warehouses where the blocks had to be dried to 15 to 20% moisture and stored in a dry place was also not solved. There was no need to talk about urban infrastructure with wood fuel stations. Those who dealt with gasifiers at that time knew that in France, at about the same time, there were already 1,500 wood fuel stations in operation. By the way, 90% of the fuel was wood charcoal. In Germany, it was planned during the Second World War to build 3,000 wood fuel stations, but only 2,000 were built. In the Union, this issue was not even resolved for trucks and tractors. For this reason, in my opinion, the director of Nadi and Ananyev did not support Peltzer, 
and he was forced to resign from there, where there were all the conditions for testing gasifier cars, laboratories and workshops. And went to work at the Institute of City Traffic because of the conflict with Ananyev. Mazin remained at Nadi, but did not promote the idea of a passenger car with a gasifier as much as Peltzer did. At least, I didn't see this in the articles that have reached us. Perhaps because it was only Peltzer's idea, and his superiors didn't want extra work. Peltzer's perseverance paid off, he created a passenger gasifier that entered the annals of Soviet history. His car reached the highest speed in the world for wood-burning cars, 94 km per hour. It was the fastest recorded speed of a wood-burning car in the world at that time. It was still necessary to record the fastest average speed. Before Peltzer's gasifier, the world record belonged to the French gasifier Panerlavasser. It was tested on a well-equipped racetrack in France in Montlhery. There, Panner Lavasser traveled 3,000 km and showed an average speed of 58.6 km per hour. Peltzer's car was tested on an ordinary country road, practically, in real conditions of an asphalted rural road, which slowed down the speed on turns, reduced speed in settlements, and when meeting other cars. Even with this, the average speed was 62.6 km per hour, and it traveled 5,000 km. The car burned just over 1,500 kg of wood. If it had run on gasoline, it would have required about 700 liters. Just over 2 kilograms of wood, both calculated and actual, replaced 1 liter of gasoline. Let me show you what the gasifier looked like schematically. The bunker held blocks for a 200 km journey and consumed 324 grams of wood per 1 km of travel. The amazing speed was probably achieved due to three furnaces with a large diameter, 14.5 mm, which provided low resistance. Three furnaces in trucks were not enough, they clogged the engine. To avoid excess resin, less than seven furnaces were not made. Western passenger cars had no less than five furnaces. Peltzer went even further and made three furnaces. The successful size of the fuel tank with not very high combustion intensity and lower temperature, a larger diameter bunker with a successful slope, allowed the use of not only standard blocks but also pieces of wood measuring 100 by 100 by 120 m. Even smaller blocks were used for trucks. With such high power and, consequently, better speed at that time, in the world, it was possible to achieve an increase in non-hydrocarbons, which amounted to as much as 3%. While in ordinary wood gasifiers, it was no more than 0.2%. There was also a high percentage of hydrogen minus 22%. Otherwise, the gas was identical to that obtained from ordinary reverse gasifiers. Usually, with lower temperature and low combustion intensity, the methane content becomes slightly higher, approximately by 1 to 2%, and the hydrogen percentage decreases, 10 to 13% or less. However, here, despite the reduced temperature, there is a large amount of hydrogen and, at the same time, a large amount of non-hydrocarbons minus 3%. I leave this puzzle for you, dear viewers, express your opinion in the comments. Well-made filters at maximum loads provided only 50 mm of water column resistance to vacuum. For example, for trucks, the norm was a figure of, 150 mm or more. For instance, just one cyclone filter alone could provide resistance ranging from 60 to 80 mm of water column, not counting other filters and pipelines. These were not all the advantages. Quick ignition, in just 5 minutes. Even if you stop the car and turn off the engine, you could restart it even after 25 minutes of downtime without reigniting the gasifier. With the help of his successful gasifier, Peltzer managed to increase the power of the M1 engine by 20% compared to similar wood-burning gasifier units. The low resistance of the filters and good gas cooling played a significant role. Many wood-burning cars, both Soviet and Western, required husking of cob stalks. In Peltzer's apparatus, this was not necessary, making the gasifier undemanding. The car traveled 5,000 kilometers without requiring stops for gasifier maintenance, apart from draining condensate. After such a long distance, the oil in the car did not darken, indicating a high degree of filtration. After this success, Peltzer wrote an article in the newspaper Maschinostroeni, where he criticized Ananyev and Nadi, recalling his dismissal, using such words as enemies of the people, hindering work. Writing such things in the press after the repression of 1937 was very dangerous, especially at a time when people were being taken away at night from their own apartments in unknown directions. I think the leadership was startled. And after this article, a special meeting was convened, where all the heads of departmental organizations highly appreciated Peltzer's work and said that, yes, indeed, for mass production, the car is very suitable, and you are a great fellow. Peltzer already poured out his soul fully. Understanding a person burning with his dream is quite possible, just as one can understand Ananyev, who probably didn't want extra work.
Peltzer wanted to settle at the Gorky automobile plant, where they made the M1 cars, and to launch gasifier cars into series assembly, as was done in Europe. He also demanded that Nadi resume research in this area. Without laboratories for testing gasifiers, it was difficult for him. The head of the automotive industry present at the meeting had to make a decision on launching gasifier cars into mass production. It was decided to first introduce the car into taxis and see how it performs in real operation. Its main advantage, besides those listed earlier, was good dynamic characteristics. When a quick acceleration is needed at a traffic light after the red signal, would gasifier cars usually accelerate slowly, causing inconvenience to cars behind. Peltzer's car was free from this drawback. On October 22, 1940, the first would gasifier taxi with two best drivers from the taxi fleet, who were specially trained at the Institute of Urban Transport in driving wood-burning cars, comrades Komyakov and Dobrosertov, hit the city streets. The car was supposed to be inspected by the 10th taxi fleet. A month later, the car will be tested on briquetted peat, and it will show itself well. Peat is much cheaper, its reserves in the Union are the largest in the world. Immediately, the cost of travel decreases. In the taxi, the car traveled 10,000 kilometers, and before that, it underwent 20,000 kilometers of testing. Everything was moving towards mass production of domestic gasifier cars, which were indeed the best in the world among similar analogs. And, a few months later, the war began. Peltzer's plans and dreams collapsed like a house of cards. During the war, it was mentioned that the wood gasifier car M1 was converted to wood charcoal in 1942, and in 1943, to avoid overloading the rear axle, the gasifier was placed on a trailer. Peltzer survived the war. During the war, he tested the engine of a torpedo boat, which exploded and injured his spine. After that, Peltzer remained a cripple for the rest of his life and moved on crutches. After the war, Peltzer turned to racing cars starting from 1946, which would win prizes, but he would no longer work on gasifiers. The war ended, and gasoline became cheap. Gasifiers were no longer needed. By nature, being a pioneer and an energetic person, he continued to break speed records. He played the guitar amazingly well. He became a multiple champion of the USSR in racing. He was a very bright person with an interesting fate. In his later years, he would remain alone. Unneeded by his wife and children, he would be cared for by his older sister, Tatiana Peltzer. The wheel of industrialization turned quickly and powerfully. The 1940 plans envisaged that the USSR's industry would produce 84,500 gasifier tractors and gasifier cars. Already, 16,000 gasifier tractors were working in the fields. Tractors and trucks with gasifier cars installed on them were already being mass-produced. Peltzer was about to prove the viability of a passenger car running on wood and even peat. I won't even mention the massive construction going on in all other industrial sectors right now. Hundreds of industrial gasifiers were operating across the country. They provided gas and simultaneously smelted iron. Gas was piped to major cities, Moscow, Kiev. There were all kinds of industrial gasifiers. To tell the whole story, you'd need to make a whole series. In this film, we only touch upon gasifier transport. The Red Empire rose from the ashes of the old Russian Empire in just 24 years and began to show its teeth in world geopolitics. Germany also lacked space within its borders, the wound from the Versailles Treaty and humiliating reparations was still fresh. And on June 22, 1941, at 4 a.m., the bloodiest war in human history began. It seemed like slavery had just ended, like the devastation and banditry of the Civil War had just ended, the country had been raised from ruins, and now complete, total destruction again. Ruins. Genocide. Another attempt to enslave the entire population. It's time to tell how Soviet engineers cope with making gasifier cars simpler, cheaper, more repairable, and more functional. Gasifiers continued to be produced during the war. Thousands of gasifier tractors were working in the fields, while half-ton trucks, using wood chunks, traveled both in the rear and at the front lines. For example, half of the transport vehicles in blockaded Leningrad, the Leningrad Front, and the Red Banner Baltic Fleet were equipped with gasifier units. According to some data, by the end of the war, there were 200,000 gasifier vehicles, tractors, mobile power plants, boats, motorized units, and other installations in operation in the USSR. Most of the drivers of gasifier vehicles in the rear were women, who, having mastered the profession, came up with a ditty, I start the car without gasoline on gas. By the end of the first year of the war in 1941, there were about 100,000 gasifier vehicles in service equipped with 12 types of gasifiers. 
With the start of the war, gasifiers were more relevant than ever. A directive from the Deputy Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR AI Mikoyan No. 8581 dated August 31, 1941, came into force, obliging all commissariats, departments, and councils of the Union Republics to give priority to the technical condition of gasifier vehicles. Repair all defective gasifier vehicles and their motor pools within a month and ensure their uninterrupted operation. Provide spare parts and tires for gasifier vehicles as a matter of priority, this was the wording of the directive. In 1941-1942, the collective of the engine department of the Bauman Moscow State Technical University, at that time the institute was evacuated to Ishevsk, under the leadership of E.K. Mazing continued work on the development of gasifier installations and the conversion of diesel engines to gaseous fuel. As a result, to improve the fuel ignition process, it was proposed to inject a small amount of liquid fuel at the very end of the compression stroke. Thus, a new type of engine was born, the gas diesel. The most significant improvement achieved, not out of luxury, concerned the gasifier cores. The thing is, the cores in gasifiers were the most critical and weakest part. Neither Imbert nor Soviet engineers managed to solve this problem completely. The notorious diabolo-shaped form of the gasifier core was entirely cast from various alloys. Imbert used heat-resistant stainless steel with 9% nickel and 18% chromium content. Before the war, nickel was an expensive metal in the Union, and it was not used. Frankly speaking, this rare earth metal was always in deficit everywhere. Hitler used it for the armor of his tigers, and he also catastrophically lacked it. In the Union, they went the path of using ordinary low-carbon steel but coated it with aluminum and baked it, scientifically speaking, aluminized it. Aluminum penetrated the steel and created a protective film. Thus, a metal gasifier core made of 8 mm thick steel burned out twice as slowly and could operate for 1,000 to 1,300 hours approximately 40,000 kilometers of travel, roughly six months of operation. If the core was not aluminum coated, it burned out in two to three months, about 500 hours of operation. Tests showed that after 200 to 500 hours of core operation, scale laid away 3.5 millimeters of steel if it was not aluminized. If you add to this also low quality casting, of which there was a lot of defective material, there were cases when the core cracked or burned out within a month of operation. And there was a lot of defective material, Due to constant sharp heating and cooling, the metal could not withstand and cracked. The crack mainly occurred from the neck. The place where the core was welded to the hopper broke off. The metal expanded and contracted due to temperature. The first cores were welded at the neck, the weld broke immediately in the first month. Repair by welding did not help, it lasted only briefly. Imbert's cores had the same problem, they cracked. They tried to solve the problem by lining. But even on the best German gasifiers, linings did not last for 10,000 kilometers of travel, about 500 hours of operation. Even the best alloys could boast only an extra 1 or 2,000 hours of operation. Expensive nickel was not worth it. Even today, few will cast stainless steel to order, let alone heat-resistant stainless steel. It required a very cheap and repairable solution. Imbert foresaw this and made bunker attachment flanges in his serial models to replace the core. The internal bunker was pulled out like a matryoshka, the cracked core was cut off, and a new one was screwed back in. But Soviet engineers came up with an even simpler solution. 